Hi, everyone, and welcome to Atmosphere Live. I'm Jill Bennett, and I will be the moderator for this session. We're talking about the art and science of delighting customers, as well as moving fast and faster in a data-driven era. We have a great panel that will discuss it from a number of different vantage points, including media, telecom, retail, and real estate. It includes Randy Clods of US Cellular, Ben Darr from Thrillist Media Group, and Nathan Pettyjohn. He is the CEO of Aisle 411, which is doing work with Google Projects, Google's Project Tango in the retail space. And we also have Jeff McConaughey. He is from Trulia. We'd also like to hear from you. So to ask a question, just log in at the bottom of your screen and type it in. It is just that easy. But I want to get started with our first guest. Our first guest works for a company that uses technology and mapping to make its website sticky and downright addictive. He is Jeff McConaughey. He is the VP of Engineering and Consumer Services at Trulia. Jeff, it's great to have you here. Thank you. It's great to be here. Now, let's first touch on the whole aspect of buying a house. It is one of the biggest, if not the biggest, financial commitment of our lives. And how do you actually make that experience delightful, exciting, all those good things? Yeah, Jill, you're spot on, and our data says the same thing. In fact, our most recent research is telling us that it's 18 and a half months from the time someone starts their home search until they're actually ready to make their offer. And this is really why Trulia was founded. We help to provide unbiased information about properties to consumers, which ultimately helps them to have better insights. And then we connect them with a real estate professional who can help them through what's really the biggest transaction of their life. And when you, when you talk about how we delight our customers, we focus on three things. Give them the information that they need, give it to them quickly, and give it to them when and where they need it, which in our case is often on their mobile devices while they're out touring an open house or touring a neighborhood. So it seems as though it's taking that real estate model, the old one, and turning it on its head a, a little bit. I mean, how big is this change? Oh, it's huge. The old way would be check the newspaper, try to track down an agent on the phone, you go to an open house, maybe peek over the fence and see if you can see the neighbor's yard. And if you're lucky, you bump into someone who lives nearby who can tell you a little bit about the neighborhood. With Trulia, you get all the information integrated seamlessly with Google Maps. And this allows you to see around the property so you can see those backyards, but you can also see things like schools and parks and where the restaurants are that are nearby. And if you peel that back a little further, we actually give you detailed information about local crime statistics and what your commute might be like if you were to live here. And this is really the power of the geographic data. It allows us to customize the experience, not just for every home, but for every home buyer. So how are you actually customizing for the home buyers? Well, safety is often a top concern. So if you're concerned about natural hazards such as floods, we integrate historical data into our maps. And nobody likes to pay too much, and we all feel like we probably do. So we detail information like average price per square foot for the area where you're searching, often all the way down to the block level. And if you want to go local, we have millions of consumers who are providing unfiltered feedback in our social community every day. What are the sorts of questions you're getting? It's everything. You know, when do the trains run through? Can I hear them from the house? How bright are the lights from the local football field at night? If it snows, do I have to move my car? We love these conversations and we get really excited about it. And it's one of the reasons I often tell people Trulia really is a technology company that happens to dabble in real estate. So it goes back to that old adage of the more you know, the more comfortable you'll actually feel. Absolutely. And also the more that you're likely to take action. So one of my favorite stories is about a couple this past Christmas they were out shopping at Christmas time, and they'd been using Trulia for a few months to try to find a home. So the wife is in the store looking for a gift for her mother, and the husband's outside, and his phone buzzes. He pulls it out, and he's got a push notification from Trulia telling about a home that's nearby that matches some of the search criteria for what they've been looking for. He looks at it, sees that there's an open house going on that day, and so after they wrap up their shopping, they head over and check it out. And they completely fall in love with this house, and because they had already connected with an agent on Trulia, they were able to make an offer the following day, and they moved in immediately after the holidays. And to get back to your first question, this is how you delight your customer. Think about it. If we hadn't delivered that exact piece of data, when and where we delivered it, they would have completely missed out on their dream house. And it also seems to go towards something that we're hearing a lot of play on these days, and that's hyper-local awareness. What does it actually mean at Trulia? 
Yeah, I mean, for sure, it means that everyone's needs and expectations are different. So a couple that's searching for a place in Mountain View is going to have completely different needs and expectations from a family of four that's looking in Charleston or a single professional who's looking up in Anchorage. And when people ask me what I've learned in this business, this is really one of the key takeaways. Never assume that other people have your expectations. We're always reminding ourselves, Atrulia, to step out of ourselves. And we're always adapting and listening to user behavior and feedback. It sounds very easy to say, but how do you actually do it? <laughs> yeah, we do a lot of user testing. We have mm -hmm. weekly sessions in our office. And recently we did an in-depth study where we sent a team out to eight different cities across the country and we interviewed hundreds of potential home buyers and home sellers. And we learned some fascinating stuff. Like there was a woman in Minnesota that we met. She's a 36 year old looking for a three bedroom home. But what's interesting is it had to be within two miles of her mother-in-law's house and within walking distance of a Trader Joe's. And we found that some customers were keeping a separate tab open in their browsers to check distances on Google Maps just because they couldn't find that in our product. Okay. So when I hear these stories, we come back and we brainstorm and we think as a team, you know, how can we make our searches that much more local, that much more precise, and ultimately that much more delightful? And does hyper-local apply to the real estate agents as well? It does, and I'm glad you mentioned real estate agents because they're our primary customer. So we offer a number of free and paid tools that allow real estate agents to connect with home buyers and home sellers. And one of the most powerful ways for them to do this is through targeted marketing campaigns, targeted at the specific locations where consumers are searching right from their desktop. And even more powerfully, we have the ability to connect that home buyer with an agent while they're standing in front of one of the agent's listings. And they do this with our Trulia mobile app every single day. So it's really where the art of delighting people starts to make that bridge into the science that can, that can make it happen. Absolutely. We have an amazing data science team at Trulia. And one of the projects that I love that they work on is actually aggregating and analyzing every single search query across our platform. We do it anonymously with the goal being, how can we figure out what people are looking for in specific geographies so that we can custom tailor those results when people come to our site? So an example is, think about you're going to rent a house in the North Park neighborhood of Chicago. When you come and you come to our site, even if you've never been there before, those results have already been tailored that match the needs of home seekers just like you. And does it ever go the other way where the science of discovery actually impacts the art of what people are seeing on the Trulia site? It absolutely does. And actually, this was one of our first learnings in an area where Google was extremely helpful. So Google Maps is an amazing tool for driving and I use it pretty much every day. And when we wanted to expand on that and tell the story about a home or a neighborhood, what we realized is that the colors really, we wanted to expand on the palette that we were using. We wanted to de-emphasize major roads and thoroughfares while emphasizing things like the parks and the bodies of water. So we were able to do this very easily using the styled maps within the Google Maps API by emphasizing these colors and really bringing them out. And I think it's this attention to detail that's really helped to keep our, all of our platform very sticky. And it's mm -hmm. really helped us as the consumer traffic has migrated from the desktop into mobile. And you touched on the mobile app, but I want to bring up the, the Android watch, which yeah. you're actually wearing, and the app. Yeah, the, uh, Android Wear is, is an awesome thing. And we were lucky enough to be a launch partner with Google for Android Wear earlier this year. And for us, it was a no brainer. Uh, we're all about s seamlessly fitting into your life. And you think back to the example I gave of the gentleman at the mall, mm -hmm. he had to reach into his pocket to pull out his phone to look at that notification. If he had an Android Wear, he would have seen it right on his wrist. He could have looked through the photos, browsed the information, and then decided if he wanted to dig in deeper. And we're all about wearables and trying to be less intrusive in people's lives. It's for those real estate junkies who are out there yeah. who you're counting on. That was terrific. Thank you so much. With all this attention to detail, it's easy to see why Truly has been such a success. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Much appreciated. Jeff will be back a bit later for a roundtable discussion. If you have any questions for him or any of our panelists, you can log in and enter it at the bottom of your screen. In the meantime, we are going to move from how your phone can get you to the outside of a building to how it can help you to get you where you're going once you've actually walked through the door. It's an area our next guest knows very well. And as you'll see in this short video clip, one that is really exciting 
Google. It is called Project Tango, and it's giving developers the ability to use devices in brand new ways to experience 3D space. For example, what if you could capture the dimension of your store or office by simply walking around it with a phone before you went furniture shopping? That is just one possibility. Take a look. My name is Johnny Lee, and I work in the Advanced Technology and Projects Group at Google. Our small team here, based in California, has been working with universities, research labs, and industrial partners to harvest the last 10 years of research in robotics and computer vision to concentrate that technology into a very unique mobile phone. We are physical beings that live in a 3D world, yet mobile devices today assume that the physical world ends at the boundaries of the screen. Our goal is to give mobile devices a human-scale understanding of space and motion. This is going to allow people to interact with their environment in just a fundamentally different way. Uh, which most likely is going to enable developers to invent what the next generation mobile apps are going to look like. What happens if you have all of these pieces in a phone? How does that change what a phone is? It is my pleasure to welcome Nathan Pettyjohn. He's CEO of Aisle 411. Nathan, it's great to have you here. It's great to be here. Thank you. All right. Now, I want to touch on a couple of things because there's a, an incredible amount of technology at play here. I mean, we're talking about computer vision, robotics, 3D modeling, but we're not all as tech savvy as, as, as certainly you are. So if we bumped into one another at a backyard barbecue, how would you explain it all to me? Well, first, I'd ask you to take out your mobile phone and use Google Maps to search for a nearby pharmacy. But imagine that the experience didn't stop at the door and that you could actually navigate all the aisles to find a product on a shelf, just like you do using your other Google products that you know and love today. But you actually had the opposite experience. Yeah, I did. And in retrospect, I'm grateful. Uh, but at the time, I was very frustrated and happy. I found myself in a big box hardware store um, looking for a surge protector. And actually, a product <laughs> just like this. Uh, it's about a $20 everyday product. And I spent 10 minutes wandering the aisles. In fact, I had three different associates actually send me in three different directions. Um, so I finally found the product. I made my way to the cash register. And I'm sitting there thinking, why couldn't I have just uh, found my product, used my smartphone to do that, paid for the item, and been gone 10 minutes ago and been happy? And what year was this? Uh, this was 2007, which was part of the problem. Mm, I'm guessing technology wasn't quite there yet? or. Yeah, we had about 9 million smartphones on the market in 2007. And we had digital mapping, but we were more focused on roads and how to get to, let's say, uh, Minneapolis to St. Louis, or how do I get from the hotel to the airport? And you saw the opportunity. You're standing at the cash register, and you're thinking the brain is churning. Uh, we did, uh, and it turned out retailers did too. Uh, we started asking retailers, what if uh, shoppers could use tools like Google Search, like Google Maps, only use it to help them navigate your stores and have a delightful experience inside the store. But retail margins can be pretty thin. So how did you actually convince retailers to go ahead and make what could be a very expensive technical investment? Well, that's the thing. They had already made that investment. Retailers uh, have invested in technology to help them understand what inventory is in the store, um, how to merchandise their products, and what shelves do they sit in. They just needed somebody like aisle 411 to come in, help them organize that data, optimize it, and put it in front of a consumer on a mobile device. So you saw the window was open and you jumped in. Uh, we did. Within about two years, uh, we were deployed in 600 retail locations. And today we service about uh, 13,000 retail stores across the United States. So explain how Project Tango fits into all of this. Sure. It starts with what we call the resiliency of the storefront. And uh, we've been hearing this for a couple of decades now that the, the, the brick and mortar retail store is going to die. Um, but in fact, about 90% of all retail transactions take place at a physical store, um, you know, even with all the excitement around e-commerce. So where Project Tango comes in um, is basically we had to find a partner that could help us scale. Uh, we had to find a partner that could help us apply new technology because this isn't going to be available in just tens of thousands of locations. It's going to be available in hundreds of thousands of locations. OK. So explain to me a little bit about um, what partners you decided to work with. 
Yeah, well, um, you know, we work with Walgreens and we actually went to uh, Walgreens with uh, Project Tango and Google and we, we decided to work with them. They have about 8,200 stores, um, but the number that always stops me is that they have 18,000 products in each of these stores. Yeah, for those of you who haven't been in one, Walgreens is actually a nationwide pharmacy chain in the U.S., but not all store layouts are the same, which is presenting a little bit of a problem. Right, and you know it's an important point that Jeff from Trulia made earlier about being hyper-local. So if the Walgreens in Atlanta has, for example, Tylenol on one shelf, uh, the Walgreens in Nashville, Tennessee, for example, is probably going to have it in a different location, and we still have to help that shopper find the product they came in looking for. So why is Walgreens doing this, and how will Project Tango make my shopping experience a little bit better? Well, Walgreens wants to win in mobile period, and they know that shoppers are walking in using their smartphones. So they want to connect with that shopper and help make for a very good, convenient experience in the store um, so that you keep coming back. In fact, uh, we put together this video clip that shows exactly what we're doing with them. At Walgreens, our mobile team is constantly reimagining the retail experience through the Walgreens mobile app. What we've found is the best innovations all tied to our stores because that's what resonates with our customers. When we saw Aisle 4 and 1 working with Google Project Tango to create an immersive mobile experience inside a store, we immediately knew this was something we had to be part of building. When we combine Project Tango's functionality with Aisle 411's indoor maps in retail stores, the store comes alive. We can overlay navigation, rewards, and personalized special offers that turns the store into an immersive, game-like experience. This is something so unique, you can only experience it in one of our stores, and only with a Tango device powered by Aisle 4 and 1. It's going to be very exciting to see how this evolves the future of the shopping experience. So as you can see, it's simply a matter of punching the items in on your smart device and getting the best route to find them. Um, it'll even reroute you if you make an unexpected trip, say, through the magazine section. Yeah, it's real game-changing technology. It's just like driving a car inside. It, exactly. Um, and, and even let's say that you get a call from home that says, hey, you need to pick up shampoo and hair conditioner. You simply plug those into your device, and you navigate right to them, and you're out the door. Okay. So let's talk a little bit, because it's extending the idea of the, the way you want to shop and working the way you want to work. So that is Nathan Pettyjohn of aisle 411. Thank you so much for a great description of your work. We appreciate your time here. You're quite welcome. Thank you. All right, we're going to bring Nathan back and Jeff back in a bit for our roundtable discussion. Again, if you have any questions, just log in and enter it at the bottom of your screen. We'll be fielding those a little bit later. So to recap, we've heard that delighting customers means meeting them where they live, that hyper-local requires that we step outside of our preconceptions and examine things on a city-by-city and store by store basis. So we're going to branch out from the theme of delighting customers to the second portion of our session, and that's using data to move quickly as a company, what we call fast, faster, and nimble. My next guest knows quite a bit about that. Ben Dar is the manager of product development for Thrillist Media Group. Based in New York City, it has exploded in the last few years thanks to a business model that blends focused content with retail commerce and also Google tools to accelerate that success. Ben, it's great to have you here with us. Great to be here, thank you. All right, and for those of you who are unfamiliar, Thrillist Media Group is the unabashed one-stop destination for 20 and 30-something men. They seamlessly blend the content and commerce, telling you the best places for brunch in Berlin, the do's and don'ts of table hopping in Los Angeles, while all while dishing out some great gear and a great shopping experience. Bendar joining us now. It's wonderful to have you here. Now, you guys have this notion that a media company should be a lot more than a bunch of uh, content generators who just hand off their readers with a click of a banner ad. So you seem to want to own both sides of the equation. The right for people, you write for people, and you sell to people. What were you thinking? Yeah, we ask ourselves that uh, almost every day. Now, <laughs> the reality is there are tons of media sites using display ads to sell you stuff, but they don't own the customer experience. They don't own the product, the ordering, the customer service. That's all handled by a different company. So the function of these media companies is to pass you on to somebody else. And would you say that's wrong? Uh, it's not wrong per se, but it's a difficult business model at best and disgenuous at worst. These companies are either acting like affiliates, which is a low margin business, or adding atmosphere via ads to draw attention to their content. Uh, we, know at, we know who we're writing for Thrillist. You nailed it at the outset. 
20 to 30 year old men who will jump at the chance to say, go into a Krispy Kreme, talk like a pirate and get a free donut. These guys want to get the best fried chicken, the best ice cream, the best local beer. So our readers are really our biggest asset and they trust us. They'll recommend, recommend us. And if they know we have their best interest in mind, they'll be influenced by what we write and they'll buy things. So there's really no way we want anyone else taking care of this group except for us. And where does Google fit into this equation? Well, in a nutshell, Google technologies are letting us hang on to this rocket ride. Uh, to understand why, you have to go back to a decision we made uh, about four years ago where we bought a company called Jack Threads. Uh, they had a great profitable business selling close to our exact customer. However, we thought our combined potential was far greater than our separate efforts, and we were pretty spot on. It began with Thrillist as the content arm and Jack Threads as the commerce arm. But over the last couple of years, we've kind of knocked down that content and commerce wall and built a unified platform where you can buy a champagne saver on Thrillist and read about the best outfits from Zoolander on Jack Threads. And in less than five years, we've gone from five million in revenue to over 100 million in revenue and from 30 people to over 300. And through it all, really, Google Technologies has served as that common denominator. Everyone uses Calendar, everyone uses Drive, everyone uses Sites and Gmail to get their job done every day. Why do you think these products have become so foundational? Um, in part, it's because we can now take the creative process into organized settings through chat, hangout, docs. So this has wiped out the 200 message email thread uh, almost overnight. Um, obviously, we still use Gmail for a lot of things, but these other tools give us the immediacy that the creative process really demands. So give us a sense of that process, that immediacy you're talking about. Sure. We're always brainstorming to look at everything attached to a sale, whether it's the products, the messaging, the fulfillment. We have a team in New York. We have a studio and warehouse in Brooklyn, and we have part of Jack Threads in Columbus, Ohio. So we jump on Hangouts all the time. Sometimes I'll even get uh, a question in a meeting, ping a developer, and even before the person's done asking the question, I'll have the answer for them. So you just can't replace that spark and productivity in these meetings with an email chain. And it's kind of going back to the theme of this session, which is how does all of this fuel a fast, nimble, faster culture? Right. So the brainstorming via Hangout, chat, and docs it makes us really fast. We can respond to shifting trends quickly, which is crucial given our readership. So it makes us nimble. Many times our readers don't relate to a product until there's a pressing reason they need it. So they'll wake up and say, holy crap, it's 45 degrees outside. I need a winter coat. Uh, we can write about these things, contextualize them, and get people to buy right now. And the faster portion comes in the kind of work I do uh, every day. I spend most of my time with the engineers working to make sure that they're following the strategic and creative guidelines that come out of these brainstorming sessions. So being able to easily refer back to and share the creative concepts helps them understand what exactly they're building and why. And just overall, being able to naturally feed the output of our brainstorming sessions into product development is key to executing against the vision of these sessions and just growing the business. Are there any other areas where you're seeing Google make an impact? Oh, yeah. I mean, our, our ad ops team relies on Google's double click for publishers in their day to day. And both our edit and product team uh, eat, sleep, and breathe Google Analytics. And this is really important because 99% of people who hit jackpots don't actually buy anything in that session. So we want to understand how to convert these uh, users into dedicated readers since we value readers just as much as we value a commerce user. Mm, that's great. Now, any, any users of Google that surprised you? Sure. Well, we have lots of conference rooms in our office uh, here in Soho. And you can reserve one in calendar, but what if you want to jump into one quickly right on the spot? How would you know right then and there which ones are open? So our director of front-end engineering actually built the web app using the Google API that shows you in real time which rooms are available. So needless to say, he's become the most popular person in the office right now. I can understand that. That is one of the big headaches around every office, I would say. So that's a great solution. Also, yeah. not surprising for those moving fast and faster. Bendar, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me.
All right, we are taking questions for Ben and all of our guests. You can log in and enter yours at the bottom of the screen. And we're now going to take a deeper dive into learning more about customer behavior to make better <clears throat> business decisions. My next guest lives with that challenge every day. He is using big, Google BigQuery to compress what we call time to insight, which he'll explain a little bit more uh, coming on. Randy Clods is the digital marketing manager for US Cellular. It is the fifth largest wireless service provider in the United States, serving almost 5 million customers every day. And he joins us from Chicago. Randy, welcome to Atmosphere Live. Hi, thanks to be here. All right, now I happen to know you describe yourself as a data fan. Why, why is that? I truly really love data information, but I'm really a creative person at heart. I went to art school, studied journalism. I even paint cartoon animals in my spare time. <laughs> but at the end of the day, I love things that look cool or cute, but I always want to know what the numbers are saying. Just because the ad looks cool doesn't mean it'll have a big impact. It's really like the old newspaper saying, if you think your mother loves you, check it out. Sorry, mom. Uh, connecting back to digital marketing. If you think an ad campaign is working, check the data. Now, in your case, that includes a lot. We have desktop, website, mobile data, as well as the store data, right? That's right. So we call online and offline. The example I like to use is to ask people to think about the last time they bought a mobile phone. You really want the Samsung Galaxy S5. If you're like, most folks, you did your research online, asked a friend, asked a neighbor, when it's actually time to get the phone, what did you do? You probably ultimately went to a retail store, feel the phone in your hands and interact with it in real time. After all, you're forming a two-year relationship with this device. It's not a bad idea to meet it in person first. Now, there were so many steps you described in that process. Who gets the credit for the sale in that scenario? You just said on a question that USL had been asking for several years. Google BigQuery has finally given us, given us, gotten us close to a solid answer. Like many telecoms, we have substantial investments in online marketing, display advertising, and web resources. We also compete in many of our markets head to head with wireless powerhouses like Verizon, AT&T, Sprint, and T-Mobile. When the stakes are high, we want to arm ourselves with the data-driven evidence that we're putting our money in the right places. Being able to invest wisely the right marketing channels and really ultimately on the right device screen accurately, whether that be desktop, mobile, or tablet is critical. So before you moved to BigQuery and got this answer, what did you see when you checked the data? It was really like deciphering a foreign language. It really was. We had three different reports that detailed online and offline sales, three different reports and three different formats and three different owners. Often it would appear that many of the purchases that came in through the web ultimately fulfilled by other channels, such as telesales or retail stores. We strongly suspected that the truth met somewhere in the middle. So what did you do and what spurred you to do it? I guess you can blame the busy holiday season. Third quarter of every year, many advertise, advertisers try to figure out how to spend way, ways to drive the most sales the rest of the year, usually to meet a given sales goal. The budgeters want evidence that they'll get a return on that investment. They want hard numbers, not just proxy figures like we had X number of clicks on a certain campaign, uh, what we call click-through rate. We'd already built a strong data-driven reputation internally through the use of Google Analytics Premium. People grew to trust it as somewhat of a record of truth. And we're fortunate to work with Cardinal Path, a company that really understands how to distill that information into something statistically meaningful and relevant. I think it was Forrester Research that once called them web analytics ninjas was the term. That's a pretty good description. They definitely have a black belt in web analytics. So we asked them to do was to use BigQuery to tie any kind of online activity in Google Analytics to any offline sale or activation which began on the website. For digital advertising via multiple channels to help lead a potential customer to USCellular.com, where he sure did their research, uh, grew to love the Samsung Galaxy S5, or another smartphone, but may have not been ready to fulfill that, commit to that purchase online at that exact moment. Really wanted to determine a fair way to ensure that online marketing lead one that ultimately went to buy that GS5 in the US Solar store or via telesales could be given some level of credit to that particular purchase. What we were able to do with BigQuery was connect many of these points in the sales process, just like drawing a line through points on a graph. And it took about a month for the initial project. What did you learn? For the first time, we had data-driven answers we wanted. We'd always suspected that online activities were driving a bigger portion of sales. Now we started to get a feel for exactly how much. And this is amazing about using good data great analytical tools and a statistically based approach, you start to overcome the reluctance of many to take action. Like what? Budgeting is one of the really biggest. If you suddenly realize that the mobile website was driving much more traffic than in previous quarters, for example, 
you might want to invest in mobile site innovations and more mobile advertising. With all the data points connected, you can make a stronger case to build future marketing programs. All right, Randy, let me close by asking this. For someone who's in your shoes and trying to sort through all of this information, what's the biggest lesson you've learned? When you have great data and great analytics, you create a single source of truth from which everyone can learn and act quickly. All right, Randy, thanks so much for walking th us through the process and being with us today. You're quite welcome. All right, let me bring back my three other guests, Jeff McConaughey of Trulia, Nathan Pettyjohn of IL411, and Ben Dar of Thrillist Media Group. And let's go through. We have some questions coming in here. I want to start with uh, Jeff. Let's say I'm a 30-year-old single female in New York City. How different would my view on Trulia be versus my parents who've been living in the city for 20 years? That's a good question. Um, one thing we know is that millennials are renting more than any other generation in our history. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm going to guess the 30-year-old, you're going to be renting. I'm guessing the parents are probably going to be looking to buy. And based on what our analysis would show in New York, I'm going to guess we would we would probably show you information for properties around the High Line or Chelsea for, you know, for a millennial, 30-year-olds, you want to be out there. Um, and for your parents, probably up in the Upper East Side would be my guess. Okay, great. And this question is for Randy next. Uh, Randy, what did you learn about your customers with the project? Surprisingly or unsurprising to many, Current customers as well as prospective customers are really flocking to the web. So they're really using their mobile device as their source of reaching the internet, uh, more so than desktop. So we're really trying to focus a lot of our innovations on a mobile website as well as mobile advertising. Okay, and we move to Nathan next. Nathan, uh, why would retailers actually want to help me get through the store faster? It, it seems as though it would be in their best interest to have me wandering through the aisles and picking up different items. That's a great question. And ultimately, retailers want shoppers to come in and make impulse purchases, uh, buying more than they, they actually came in the store for. And so kind of the, the older uh, merchandising mentality was if the consumer is a little confused, they might stumble upon some shiny object and, and say, hey, I need that, that uh, product. But what we're able to do is actually with a science, um, we can delight that customer with a product recommendation that they might not otherwise have thought through. We can actually do that digitally um, and, and we can create that impulse purchase that they wouldn't have otherwise purchased, you know, if they were lost and frustrated. Okay, sounds good. All right. And for Ben, you say your company is fast. Do you only have uh, Gen X and millennial employees? Do you think companies that have an older workforce could actually all use all of the same tools that you've been talking about? So we do trend a little closer to Gen X, but we have people of all ages uh, in our company and within all the different departments and they have no problem fitting into our fast uh, nimble workflow. I think it just comes down to being open to trying new technologies and new things uh, every year to see what new things are out and what can help really uh, expedite uh, things that are happening in your workflow and allow you to be more creative and more productive. Okay. And Nathan, I have a, what, this is coming in from an audience question, how can consumer electronics retailers use IL411? Sure. Well, um, you know, basically, uh, consumer electronic retailers. So imagine uh, a shopper coming in and, and wanting to, to navigate to a specific product, but, but allowing them also to discover new products. So um, shoppers can use the, the experience on, you know, their mobile device. Um, they can navigate to the right product and get product recommendations. So any, any electronic retailer could use it just the way that uh, a grocer does or a Walgreens, for example. And how about Google technology to maximize that sell through? Sure. Well, by integrating the, the solutions with, you know, uh, Google search or Google maps, um, it all just uh, brings more users, more store trips, more traffic, and ultimately more sales. Okay. And Randy, I have a quick question for you. How long did the project actually take? We were able to initially launch it within the first month, but it did take several months just to get us up and going. Okay. Terrific. And I want to thank all of my guests for their time today and all of you for your great questions and your social media postings. We've enjoyed reading them through. Uh, just a reminder that this session will be available for playback on YouTube in case you missed anything. We are going to close with a video from Google about everything that we've talked about today, delighting customers, moving quickly, and blending art and science to do both. I'm Jill Bennett. Have a great day, and please enjoy.
It's not enough for the technology to be awesome. There needs to be a great story about why we should love it and how it fits in our lives. And if that story is compelling enough, people will want the technology. They want to build it and they want to use it. Here's a cool example from my personal experience at Google. We got invited by some engineers to check out the brilliant new heads-up display technology. I was blown away. You knew this was going to change the world, but no one knew exactly what this thing was yet. So we went away to create the story. We pretended the product was finished, and we made an ad for it. It was pure fiction. We made it up. We were like, hmm, what would we want? Literally, to make the film, we had cameras strapped to our heads. A design intern just made up the look of interface, and we just told the simple story of how the product might fit in a regular person's life. When we played the film for the engineers, Sergey was like, this is cool. Maybe we should build that. Later on, they were joked, hey, maybe you guys should make a film every week and we'll just build products against it. Funny, but flattering. Our two-minute film, an exercise to pretend, actually helped shape hard-engineered reality. Stories influencing technology is nothing new. In the 1960s, a designer on the set of Star Trek created Captain Kirk's communicator. Kirk Enterprise. Scott here, sir. We're beaming up. An engineer at Motorola, who was a huge Star Trek fan, was so inspired by the designer's work that he invented the cell phone. Soon, the cell phone looked like this. Look familiar? Another example, when Spielberg was preparing Minority Report, he and his production designer invited a group of tech geniuses to a three-day think tank to come up with the look of the future. Then, they hired a young engineer with a great name to come on set and build the fictional technology, including Tom Cruise's famous screens. It's unclear. When the film came out, an engineer Raytheon was so pumped up about those screens that she licensed the fake tech and turned it into real tech. Now the military is using it, and pretty soon, it'll be available to the public. And this just popped up the other day. Elon Musk, the scientist behind Tesla Motors and SpaceX, who I totally had a man crush on, said on Twitter that he could design rocket parts using hand gestures and then print those designs in titanium. John Favreau, director of Iron Man, said, like in my movie? And Musk said, yeah, saw in the movie and made it real. Good idea. Amazing. Okay, so what's my point? Amazing things happen when there's a strong connection between the tech side and the art side. Scientists shouldn't have to randomly see something inspiring in a movie. And storytellers shouldn't have to hope that someone stumbles upon the creative fantasy. Have the science influence the fiction and the fiction influence the science directly. Get these people in the same room, working together, inspiring each other.